So welcome, uh, welcome uh, everyone uh, to this uh, panel discussion uh, titled uh, Is European Strategic Autonomy Growing Stronger? Uh, this panel is uh, organized by the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at the International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn. Um, and it is, of course, part of uh, the bigger conference, uh, Baltic EU Conversation, where our Latvian colleagues at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs uh, are the main organizer. And I would like to thank uh, Lia uh, for this uh, great opportunity to join forces and, and to have an all Baltic uh, full day event uh, that looks at uh, topical issues in the European Union. My name is uh, Kristi Reik. Uh, I am the director of the Estonian Foreign Policy Institute at ICDS and uh, I am very happy to moderate uh, this discussion with uh, very experienced and uh, knowledgeable panelists uh, whom I will introduce uh, in a moment. But first, uh, let me share a couple of uh, words of introduction on uh, the topic. Um, it uh, was the European Global Strategy adopted in 2016 uh, that uh, made uh, the strategic autonomy uh, a concept uh, that is vividly discussed in the context of uh, EU security and uh, defense uh, policy. Until then, it was not uh, absent from the European discussions, but uh, we rarely had academic or policy debates in the EU on autonomy or even less so on European sovereignty. But now we have had uh, the debates for five years, and I'm afraid uh, we are still not uh, very much closer to a common understanding in Europe about what uh, strategic autonomy means and uh, even whether the concept is uh, desirable at all or whether some other options such as uh, strategic responsibility uh, would be preferable. Uh, we also cannot speak about uh, very much uh, practical progress in implementing the concept, uh, but that's exactly what we will uh, discuss during uh, today's panel, uh, what uh, have been the practical steps in, in implementing uh, the idea of uh, European uh, strategic uh, autonomy. Um, let me note that there have been some interesting uh, shifts in the uh, debate. Uh, what uh, started uh, as a discussion very much focused on security and defense and on the transatlantic uh, relationship and how that relates to European strategic autonomy has more recently actually become a broader discussion on European sovereignty and it also uh, encompasses uh, uh, the field of the economy, it encompasses uh, matters of uh, technology, trade, industry, health, etc. And I believe there is this um, common sense uh, in, in Europe that uh, we need to respond to global changes around Europe. And uh, these changes include uh, the tightening great power competition. Uh, they include uh, the US-Chinese rivalry and the rise of uh, China. Um, we still have, uh, I think, a very clear understanding in this part of Europe and not only here about the unique importance of the transatlantic relationship for uh, European security. But uh, we also have to address the question of uh, how does the US-Chinese rivalry impact Europe and uh, how does the weakening position of the US as a global leader uh, have an impact on, on Europe. So all these changes, uh, around us uh, have contributed to this understanding that uh, Europe needs to be more capable to determine and defend its interests and values on the global stage and, and to do it with partners whenever possible, but alone when necessary. This has been agreed uh, in the relevant uh, EU documents. 
Uh, today, um, the aim of this panel is uh, not to dwell into kind of conceptual matters of what exactly, how do we define uh, strategic autonomy or, or sovereignty, but uh, rather to be down to earth and, and look at the practical steps that uh, have been made and the expectations, but also at the broader strategic picture and actually be global uh, in the scope of our discussion. and, and uh, ask, uh, for example, how to strengthen European autonomy without undermining the transatlantic uh, alliance, and also how to make uh, Europe uh, less vulnerable to the growing uh, Chinese influence. So these are uh, some of the questions that we are going to discuss. I believe it's a very ambitious uh, set of questions. And uh, we have uh, a perfect uh, set of panelists, I think, to, to address them. So let me introduce now our distinguished uh, panelists. We have uh, with us Urmas Baet, a member of uh, the European Parliament and uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Estonia. Then Zanda Kalnina Lukasevica, Parliamentary Secretary and Vice Minister of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of uh, Latvia. Uh, François Heisbourg, uh, who is a very prominent uh, French security expert and currently senior advisor for Europe at the International Institute for Strategic uh, Studies. And uh, last but not least, Hans Christian Hagman uh, from Sweden, uh, who is a senior advisor and uh, head of uh, strategic analysis at uh, the Swedish uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I'm very grateful to all of you for joining us. At this point, let me make a note to the audience. Uh, those of you who are following us in Zoom, uh, please post your questions and uh, comments to the Q&A function. You can do it uh, already now or later on, and I will do my best uh, during the discussion to pick up these questions and, and uh, address to the panelists. But now it's time to actually move uh, to the introductory remarks of the panelists. I, I asked you to be uh, fairly short so, so that we will have time for, for discussion. And I would like to start uh, with uh, Urmas Baet and, and ask you, especially about the field of uh, defense, which is where the strategic autonomy discussion has focused on, uh, what has been achieved in terms of implementing the concept? What has the EU been doing uh, to be more capable of taking care of European security? Has it actually made us more secure? And what are the expectations uh, for the future? So please, Omas Pat, over to you. So well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope uh, you can hear and, and see me. A uh, short answer to your question is that, uh, sure, uh, the, there has been some development. Uh, I guess that one of the main points so far actually is the increase of awareness about uh, what Europe has to do and what Europe is uh, capable to do. Uh, but if we, of course, uh, look at uh, very practical steps, uh, then sure, they are modest. And they are modest uh, mainly because uh, there is still no real political consensus among EU member states. Uh, what should be the speed and, of course, what also should be the substance of uh, so-called strategic autonomy. If I look from my point of view, uh, then I see that, uh, well, it is absolutely logical that Europe has uh, the richest and also the well, biggest uh, unit in the world uh, should be also ready to manage its own security issues, its own economy issues, trade issues and so on. So that in this sense, it is completely logical. There is no adequate reasons why Europe uh, has to be uh, dependent from the United States or, or, or any other uh, superpower in the world. Um, and it, of course, also should not mean that it underestimates the cooperation with the United States or Canada or, or NATO. Not it's vice versa. I guess the ideal goal should be that Europe can manage 
uh, but the added value still comes uh, from the cooperation with uh, countries in the world who share uh, the same values, plus, of course, NATO as well, if we speak about um, security and defense issues. The problem still is that uh, there are too many politicians and decision makers and also well people who actually don't understand what exactly means this strategic autonomy. There are also people who still are afraid uh, of so-called European army when we speak about security. So that uh, I personally actually prefer uh, if you really want to speak about the real issues, not even to use uh, this kind of terminology uh, because it is already uh, a bit confusing. Of course, there are also lots of things what Europe has to do and then can do actually immediately. We are very proud that there is, for example, European Union's common foreign and security policy. But the fact is that if you look at the well, classical tools uh, of foreign policy, be it diplomacy, be it foreign trade, be it development cooperation, and also security and defense, uh, then first these four tools, they are not functioning uh, together. And uh, the last one, I mean the common, well, security and defense part actually is still very, very weak. So that it's clear that the uh, European Union is not using its potential uh, in international affairs and, and globally. And another is uh, the same issue that what exactly is the political will or, or political willingness of member states to make really more cooperation and also to uh, send or delegate more obligations uh, well to the European Union. We have seen in the same sphere of uh, common defense and security policy that this is developing very, very slowly because there is lack of real political will in, in many capitals in Europe to, to make uh, here more uh, cooperation. But also if you look at trade and, and economy, then, then here also we, we see shortcomings that, for example, well, European businesses and business community has very often um, much more limited options uh, abroad than, for example, representatives of this or that uh, country or business community here on the European markets. So that it is also still unfair uh, very often that uh, well, European businesses are not on the equal footing comparing with uh, partners from uh, third countries, so that when we really want to speak about uh, well, fair and, and adequate conditions also for European businesses, then also what concerns European trade policy, then also here we have to uh, make um, more concrete steps. So that you ask to be short, uh, I, I will sum up so that um, yes, uh, so-called strategic autonomy for me is completely well normal development uh, but at this stage uh, there are still too much uh, well misinformation and misunderstandings especially what this strategic autonomy is and, and especially in the field of, of security and defense and of course in final end everything in the european union depends on this what uh, european union member states want or they don't want to do. Where is this political uh, support and consensus? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This was a good talk that uh, pointed to a number of uh, hurdles on the way of actually strengthening uh, European strategic autonomy. And you also referred to uh, the different uh, tools, so to say, in the EU toolbox, uh, which are not uh, used to, to the uh, full uh, potential. And uh, now I would like actually to ask our uh, next uh, speaker, Zanda Kalnina Lukasevic, to look uh, more at, uh, at the field of uh, economy and uh, trade. By the way, this is something that was uh, also um, discussed uh, a little bit in the morning uh, in the session with the uh, Commission Vice President uh, Dombrovskis. And uh, he, um, he had the same question that I was going to pose to you about uh, what does open strategic autonomy of the European Union mean? And, and uh, he 
did um, refer to this slogan that uh, we have to be multilateral when we can, but uh, unilateral when necessary, and think more about uh, ways to actually be unilateral when uh, the agreed rules are violated by other players and we need to protect uh, European interests. Um, so this, this debate has also been uh, very uh, lively in the EU over the recent uh, uh, times in the, during the recent uh, the, the past year. And of course, it uh, very much has to do with uh, China, but not only China. One of the questions is how to address unfair um, practices uh, and unfair competition with uh, China. So now over to Sanda Kanina Lukasiewicz, please. Thank you, and uh, thank you for having me on, on, on this panel. And uh, indeed, I'm particularly pleased that this year, this uh, Baltic EU conversations are going really Baltic, and, and you are leading this panel discussion uh, from Tallinn. Uh, thank you for this question. And uh, I think it will not be a surprise for many of you that uh, I quite agree with uh, Commissioner Dombrovskis uh, on, on the EU trade policy. Uh, but still, there are uh, several aspects I would like to, to uh, underline and, and uh, give some more uh, comments uh, from the Latvian perspective. And uh, as you already mentioned, uh, the discussion on, on strategic autonomy really have shifted from security and defense towards other sectors and, and involves actually not only uh, economic and trade policy, but also financial sector and digital autonomy. Actually, it's uh, about all uh, EU policy areas. And uh, before going in, into more details about the trade policy, uh, just in few uh, words, I would like to describe uh, what Latvians think about the strategic autonomy also in security and defense, where we are supporting uh, targeted and coordinated actions uh, based on, on complementarity as a key criteria. So, Yes, we need to invest in our resilience uh, in a broad sense, uh, including uh, resilience uh, against hybrid threats and, and uh, terrorism. We need to develop uh, European capabilities and strengthen military uh, industry. And we need to catch up in some crucial high-end and emerging military uh, technologies in research and development. And actually it has some linkages with, with the question of, of digital economy and digital uh, autonomy as well. And the EU's task is to ensure military mobility across the continent. So at the same time, we have to keep in mind the European defense initiatives are to be developed in complementarity to our own efforts within NATO. So there is no alternative security provider to Europe, but NATO. And actually all those ongoing work trends in different dimensions from security to finances, from trade to digital need to be synergized as well. So if nationally we talk about, uh, um, if nationally we talk of whole of government and whole of society approach, then here we should promote whole of Brussels and whole of the union approach. So the recent discussions in global supply and value chains uh, and uh, trade in general due to the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed Europe's vulnerabilities and external dependencies. We all vividly remember the situation in last year where there were enormous shortages of, of face masks, uh, for example, because we were dependent on the supplies from China. So we have to address these problems. And clearly discussions on strategic autonomy are part of a broader conversation of Europe's role in involved and uh, it continued competitiveness. So open and free trade is valuable when it is fair and based on rules. And the current trade environment uh, is characterized actually by growing protectionism, uh, frictions among economic uh, superpowers, uh, enormous challenges caused by the pandemic and indeed by unfair trade practices by our trade partners like China, but not only. And so China's economic model and its trade policy is undermining the global trade uh, system with the World Trade Organization at its core and creates market distortions here in Europe. So we cannot remain idle and need to be able to address these challenges, which means 
we, the EU, need to have effective instruments in our toolbox. So the Commission recently published a trade policy review uh, presented by Valdis Dombrovskis, as already, exp uh, has already explained, um, actually uh, consists of, of many uh, important aspects, and, and we really support uh, this new trade strategy. So the concept of, of open strategic autonomy lies in the core of this renewed policy. And due to the scope of this discussion, actually the member states are still debating what open strategic autonomy entails and how it could be achieved. And there are many different perspectives, to be honest. I think uh, it is important to strike a balance between our true liberal trade approach and sense of protectionism. So, which means for us to stay open for trade, yet at the same time to have effective tools to protect the Europe's economic interests. So I agree the EU needs effective and strong tools to protect our economic interests when it is necessary, in particular, but not only to counter actions of China's economic model and policy. Uh, so to conclude, um, I wanted also to, to mention that prevailing consensus uh, is that the post-COVID recovery will be foiled by the EU's industry and be contingent on fully functioning uh, a single market. But most importantly, more competitive and by that less dependent on others in critical industrial sectors. So, uh, but do not get me wrong, uh, autonomy does not mean uh, self-sufficiency. I believe in the current global environment, it is impossible to uh, operate in isolation. So we shall be open to trade, seek to diversify, uh, diversify um, external supply chains and build internal capacities to make Europe more resilient to possible future disruptions. And for example, in the field in, in, in healthcare equipment and pharmaceuticals. So I really strongly believe uh, we should strengthen the resilience of Europe's economy, but not sleepwalk into protectionism while doing that. Europe has always been and should remain fully committed to a strong rules-based multilateral system, and it means open system. So for that reason, working on Europe's resilience, uh, be it security, economy, digital, or trade, close cooperation with like-minded partners, such as the United States, Canada, Japan, and Australia, is of utmost importance. And here it allows us to bridge uh, this uh, towards openness and autonomy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, as you pointed out, uh, uh, autonomy is uh, in the field of economy and trade. It's not uh, the same thing as uh, isolationism, and uh, it is not uh, possible for Europe to be self-sufficient, and that's not what we should aim at, but it's the diversification, uh, which is one of the key words uh, to, to look at, uh, especially in the light of the pandemic uh, experience. Uh, you also uh, referred to the US and later that's something that I would like to get back to. This question is very important, both in the field of uh, defense, but also in trade. To what extent we actually have a shared approach uh, with uh, our American allies and partners. But uh, now it's uh, time to turn uh, to Mr. Hans Christian Hagman and, and uh, well, oh, sorry, <laughs> now, now I was jumping jumping ahead of, uh, ahead of uh, the plan. First, first we take uh, the remarks by Francois Haysburg. And, and uh, what I would like to, to ask you to address in particular is this question of to what extent we have moved closer to a shared understanding in, in Europe about our relationship to major powers, the US, China, also Russia, all of these are, are difficult uh, questions uh, for the European countries and we have uh, different national views within the EU. So how to reconcile them and uh, has the EU had any success in bringing the different national views closer together? Please, over to you. Yes, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having invited me. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be with uh, our friends from uh, 
the Baltic region, even if only virtually, uh, hopefully it will be in the flesh the next time. <clears throat> uh, several remarks. Uh, first of all, yes, you're absolutely right uh, to raise uh, the power interaction issue. Uh, and it is indeed because those interactions are changing that strategic autonomy is being thrust upon us, even including those who initially do not very much favor it, because life could be much simpler if we had only one problem and one leader and one organization. Uh, one problem, Soviet Union, Russia, uh, one leader, the United States, and one institution, NATO. But if we look at our situation today, what do we have? We have, first of all, uh, a, host, a host of security and defense issues, which involve NATO members, but which are not handled, and in some, to some extent cannot be handled by NATO, and where American leadership has essentially gone AWOL. Has, um, has moved away. Uh, if you're French and if you have a, a literal on the Mediterranean Sea, what do you note? American leadership effectively stopped in 2013. That one of the primary threats in the region to at least two members of the European Union, one of which is a member of NATO, happens to be another member of NATO, which is called Turkey. How do you deal with security and defense issues of that sort without strategic autonomy? Well, you can't. Uh, and of course, uh, just a little bit of a reminder, Russia is very present in the Mediterranean. Wagner has played a major role in Libya. Russia has played a key role in Syria. Uh, and uh, this will continue. Second remark, China. Now, China, I agreed with everything that Zanda said. But that's only part of the reality. China is not only a trade and economic and industrial issue which we have to handle between the European Union and China. China is also America's peer competitor. China is a superpower in a way which Russia is no longer. And the transatlantic relationship will be shaped in the next decade or two by the manner in which Russia, in the manner in which the United States views European policies vis-a-vis -vis China. China is important strategically for us, not only in a bilateral setting, it is even more important because of the interaction between the United States, China, Europe, and Russia. We want security from Russia. America wants cooperation on China. Well, uh, these are two eminently laudable objectives, but they are not identical. And in Washington, they will be certainly be paying very close attention to our China policy. And this is a security, defense, and strategic issue, as well as all of the things that Zanda mentioned. How do we handle that? Well, there are all sorts of ways of skinning that cat, and we can talk about that in our discussion later on. Uh, but th these are some of the reasons why we find ourselves having to give substance and to give content to this concept of uh, strategic autonomy. I would also add that strategic autonomy and sovereign and European sovereignty are not interchange are not interchangeable. Obviously, you cannot have sovereignty without having a degree of autonomy. Uh, but strategic autonomy is a narrower concept 
than the concept of sovereignty, which covers all sorts of other issues. This is what I had to say in my preliminary remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, so there were many very important points. I want to highlight in particular what you said about the crucial importance of uh, China for the transatlantic relationship. And this point that the US is looking very carefully at uh, Europe's China policies. And I think in the Baltic states, uh, we have already uh, kind of recognized this very well that uh, if we want to continue to have uh, protection from the US vis-a-vis -vis Russia, we need to be very attentive to cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China. And, and uh, that is becoming more and more important issue in the transatlantic uh, relationship. But this actually brings me now to our fourth uh, panelist. And, and uh, looking at this uh, strategic picture, the US, China, Europe, Russia, um, we have uh, not so long ago had uh, uh, an important uh, change uh, in the US, namely, we have the new president of the US, Joe Biden, who um, differs uh, clearly from his predecessor in, in uh, his overall uh, attitude to Europe and European integration and the European Union, but also NATO. Um, so one of the questions I would like to ask you to address, um, what is now uh, with the Biden presidency um, the impact uh, um, of, of the United States and transatlantic relationship on the further development of uh, Europe's uh, strategic uh, autonomy. Please, Hans Christian Hagman. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christy. And dear friends and neighbors, uh, this is uh, a very, very timely topic and it's a very, very interesting conference. Just so you know, my whole Prime Minister's office and uh, large parts of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are very interested and engaged in, in, in th these issues. Um, I'm quite close to some of the things which uh, Urmas has mentioned, and it's very easy for me to follow uh, Francois' strategic thinking. Uh, but as a civil servant uh, and as a Swede, I do have some issues with uh, strategic autonomy, especially in the time when we are really uh, seeing the opportunities of a new American leadership, which focuses so much on the values, on the democracy, on allies and on partners, uh, I'm not quite sure that, that we're sending the right signal. And to be honest, I don't think that we've ever had such a pro-European uh, State Department, uh, at least not in a generation as we have now. Um, and, they're doing this from their own interests, of course, uh, because it's good for American power and American uh, priorities, uh, but it does overlap quite a lot with our own. So I would actually be more comfortable in talking more about strategic cooperation rather than strategic autonomy. I think that's what we need more and more today. And to be honest, all of the major issues in the world, whether it's uh, managing the, the COVID crisis, whether it is uh, managing antimicrobial resistance, or it's climate change, or it's the oceans, or it's arms control, uh, we really need quite a few players on the world uh, stage to work together. Uh, and I'm not quite sure that solving things alone is the right formula. I mean, Sweden, we're firm believers in globalization and free trade, so we're not uh, we're a bit frightened by everything which is linked to, to protectionism in any shape or form. But I think we also must be realists that China is today the EU's largest trading partner. The United States is number two. And then after that, we have the UK and Switzerland. And do we really want strategic autonomy from our biggest trading partners, the ones giving us the growth and the means to live our lives the way we want when it comes to education, R&D, innovation, investments, um, and sustainability as we want. And I mean, we've all read, you know, Biden's new interim national strategic security strategic guidance, that's a mouthful, from last week. 
and I personally found it uh, myself nodding quite a lot, making a lot of notes to it. It's essentially an ode to democracy. It's an ode to cooperation. And I think this is something which would seize upon uh, rather than today uh, show some distance to it. Now, naturally, there are limits to what we should be reliant on others for. But for Sweden, we are more talking about smart and selective autonomy on a case-by-case -case basis. And to be honest, it's a matter of trust, independencies, market forces, but also trust in our own abilities. And we are heavily reliant on US security assurances and defense industrial cooperation. And only Sweden is very proud of that cooperation we have with the US and the UK. Uh, and we've put a lot of our eggs in the uh, transatlantic basket. Um, and we want to work more regionally with our, our neighbors, essentially the, the, the ones here on this conference. But we do not have these kinds of cooperation with China because we do not have the same levels of trust. And we do see China as both, I think the formula is excellent, as a partner, as an economic competitor and a systemic rival, even if we do believe in trade and that that is mutually beneficial. But from a Washington perspective, I think we are uh, not entirely clear in our rhetoric. On one hand, we uh, want to work with the United States on democracy, uh, and we want to work with the United States on multilateralism. We want US true presence in Europe. We are pro-NATO. On the other hand, we're happy to buy energy from Russia. We're happy with the 17 plus one arrangements with China. And all of us, I think, are quite happy to trade and do business with China, but also with quite a few other non-democratic states, as does the US. So our rhetoric and our actions are not always entirely consistent and our signals to Washington are not always the easiest. And I think the US does, uh, does uh, see the, the benefits uh, of NATO in a way which are really long-term and fundamental. And they also see the challenges of Turkey, which Francois mentioned. Uh, and they also see the differences in threat perceptions across Europe, from north to south, from east to west. It is a fact of life. But I am a bit concerned that strategic autonomy is code word for uh, European uh, defense industry, an EU defense industry, which locks out others, or greater focus on the Sahel or Middle East or Eastern Mediterranean. I'm also worried that it is a, a signal that we want our own defense and less of American cooperation. And at least from Sweden, we want more cooperation with the US and we really need US security engagement in Europe because honestly, Russia does not respect uh, European security arrangements. They respect the United States and American deterrence. That is what counts in, in the Kremlin. Uh, and I'm sorry to say that, that we are not on that level uh, when it comes to deterring uh, Russia. Now, Sweden is increasing its defense budget by 40%. Um, but just to allude to, to what Zanda is saying, I'm more concerned that we're focusing too much on the traditional elements. How much are we in Europe really focusing on the autonomous weapon systems, on AI, on cyber, on space, on the biological domain of warfare? So I would argue that we need more cooperation with the United States and the UK on these elements and maybe also Australia, maybe Japan in some elements. Uh, as Anna mentioned, the, the whole focus on the hybrid and the irregular elements, the, the information operations and so forth. I see we need more cooperation across the board rather than less. Uh, so if I may finally, just on a final tune on some of the vulnerabilities. And I think there is one element, if I would take Francois's arguments to, to, to heart, that we have one concern, which is slightly beyond today's imagination, but that is that Europe needs and wants to trade with both the United States and China, even if they are at loggerheads or if there is escalation on the strategic level. If there is an escalation in the confrontation, whether it's Taiwan or South China Sea, or uh, increased tensions on the trade element, we need to be able to trade with both parties. So the question is rather to both China and to the US, what guarantees we have that we will not be 
be, be, be cut off in the heat of the conflict. So if we're continuing with the rhetoric of strategic autonomy, I would see it's more as a backup, as a necessary insurance policy in case of unlikely scenarios, whether natural disasters, whether it's human health issues, pandemics, or the risk of uh, strategic confrontation between the two superpowers. But I think we should per quietly prepare for backups, but rhetorically and in action, we should seek cooperation with especially the United States, but also on China on matters of strategic issues, because we really need to work together on them. And do not forget the United States is a democracy. They are a force for the good, and they are a pillar of the multilateral system. And we need to work more with them rather than against them and Mark. So uh, it's, it's a difficult question this, but I'm really quite optimistic about the new US administration. It's not all roses, but there's a lot of good there and we need to work more with them rather than against them. So thanks. Thank you so much. Again, a very kind of uh, comprehensive global view while also pointing to some very specific uh, Swedish concerns such as defense industry issue with the uh, European strategic uh, autonomy. Um, I saw Francois was uh, shaking his uh, head at some point and, and I would like to continue a little bit uh, on, on this question of uh, Europe uh, in relation to US and China. Later, I want to get to Russia because after all, we are in the Baltic states and we always need to think about Russia. But let's uh, stay with the US and China for, for a moment. And, and uh, I think a lot of the discussion in Europe has been going on around this question of uh, whether the US is trying to force us to choose and most Europeans don't want to choose between uh, US and China and, and uh, uh, we need to have this economic relationship with China, but at the same time, yes, so let's remember the US is an ally. Um, and and uh, I find it quite puzzling that uh, sometimes in the European debate, people talk as if we really can take equidistance from the US and China. Because after all, we do have NATO and we do have the US as, as our ally. And China is not our ally, it's a different political system, it has a different vision of uh, world order, it has a different vision of uh, rules-based uh, uh, cooperation and multilateralism, etc. But uh, Francois, would you yeah. in on this question? Yeah, when I was listening to Hans Christian, uh, I thought this was the most strong plaidoyer for strategic autonomy that I've heard in a long time. You want to trade equally with China and the United States? while retaining the good graces of the United States as a cooperation partner in Europe, well, you're not going to be able to do that without a high degree of strategic autonomy. Choices are actually going to be very tough. The Biden administration is very much part of the China consensus in the United States. The China consensus is possibly the only item of political consensus in the American political system today. If there's one issue which unites Republicans and Democrats, Trumpies and Biden folks, it's China. Uh, so the notion that one can talk blithely about, oh yes, we don't want to have to choose between uh, uh, trading with China and the United States. Now I'm afraid my friend, that is not the way it's going to happen. Uh, uh, unless you decide to have a policy of equidistance, which is not what I would advocate, by the way, uh, uh, to have meaningful cooperation with the United States, you actually need to have strategic autonomy. You cannot uh, simply defer to American leadership because in some elements, American leadership is not going to be present. Let me give you a practical example on the China case. The United States has had for many years a very effective um, uh, instrument for screening Chinese te technology transfers and investments uh, uh, in both directions called CFIUS, uh, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the US. Uh, we do not have something similar in Europe. We have information exchange, but we don't have a CFIUS. Why don't we have a CFIUS? because uh, one third of EU members uh, don't want one and you need consensus here. 
this is actually where 17 plus one is a problem, a serious problem. Because yes, you have Chinese leverage on European choices. The Americans are not going to guard our own technology. CFIUS does not apply to Europe and indeed we wouldn't want it to apply to Europe because we want to be able to do our own thing. So what should we be doing? Building up our instruments of defense and offense vis-a-vis -vis China in cooperation with the United States. But for the cooperation to be meaningful, we actually need to have these instruments, which we do not currently have. Uh, will the relationship with China become more and more difficult? Yes, it will. Currently, uh, if I read the Chinese press today, big threats against the French for daring to send warships to the South China Sea, to the region of Taiwan. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know what the Chinese will actually do, but the threats are, very, are actually quite specific. Uh, I would not be surprised if we had uh, Canadian or Australian type uh, hostages in China in the near future uh, as retaliation for what we are currently doing in concert with our American, British, and a few other European partners in that part of the world. We can do it because we have strategic autonomy. Most of our European partners are not interested in being alongside the US in that part of the world. But the US will react very poorly if we have a big crisis in the Indo-Pacific region and the Europeans do not come out in economic, political, and eventually, to some extent, strategic support for what the United States is doing. Uh, we should think very, very hard when yes. we reflect on what American attitude uh, Thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, Hans Christian, I will give you soon a chance to react, but now I, I want to bring in also the sure. other speaker for this very same question, because it is so crucial. And, and I would like to ask, Urmas, uh, your view, I mean, is, is Europe kind of even, did it even start to discuss seriously enough this need to engage with the US in strategic cooperation vis-a-vis -vis China? I mean, it is one of the issues, of course, on the transatlantic EU-US agenda how to address China, but uh, the views of the member states seem to be quite far from each other and many talk much more about uh, economic cooperation and uh, other strategic and security issues. Yeah, well, uh, I guess that this choice uh, between China and, and the United States for Europe or for the European Union, of course, is completely, in fact, not adequate. Uh, because it's obvious that the United States has been and is and will be a uh, very close ally and partner for Europe, for the European Union, in all fields. Uh, so that if, if you have this global uh, outlook, then it, it's obvious that the, the balance point between authoritarian regimes, where is China, where is Russia, where are some others, on the one hand, and then a democratic camp, European Union, US, Canada, and others, on the other side. So that actually globally, uh, there is also every day's uh, movement to shift uh, this balance point. Recently, we have clearly seen that, that Russia and China are more and more uh, together again, be it in the United Nations Security Council, be it in public statements uh, that, well, they both can discuss whatever international affairs, but not human rights issues, because both uh, quite recently, China and Russia declared that human rights is their own internal business. Uh, and uh, now also after, uh, uh, well, Mr. Borrell's recent visit to Moscow, uh, one, what is clearly obvious is that, that Russia is more and more also turning towards China, also what concerns trade and business and, and all other issues. For Let's see what they're doing together, for example, in Arctic and, and so on. So that um, in this regard, actually, this is not, I would put like this, this is not adequate question, China or United States. I guess it, it should be and must be obvious if we uh, want to see that the Europe, 
European Union and European Union's foreign and security policy will be serious also in the future, then there should be not this kind of question at all. It's obvious that EU and US, EU and NATO, we have to simply stick together and do everything possible. We can strengthen this cooperation. And of course, good basis for this is the stronger Europe is, the better chances also are there for real cooperation with NATO, with the United States and with other democratic countries. Um, uh, what concerns uh, China policy, then of course, again, it would be very nice if the European Union and US, we can um, well have more and more also common approach towards China and our common foreign policy. From Europe's point of view, of course, one of the weaknesses here is that we even don't have uh, adequately functioning real common uh, policy towards China in the European Union, because we have seen all these discussions. Unfortunately, there is different level of dependency already in different European countries uh, economically, uh, for example, what concerns China. So that, of course, as first step, we should finally have real and really functioning common uh, policy here in the European Union vis-a-vis -vis China. And only then, of course, there will be uh, option that we can have also much more cooperation with the United States or any other democratic country what concerns China, but here our homework also should be done before. Uh, so that once again, in ideal world, of course, I'd like to see, as I mentioned in my starting monologue, uh, to see strong Europe and on the basis of being strong here in Europe, uh, then we of course should develop uh, as much as possible our cooperation with US and other democratic countries in the world, because the same competition between authoritarian regime, their value system, and democratic one is stronger and stronger. But again, uh, this is, I don't see here history uh, that the autonomy idea is somehow against this goal. Because once again, the stronger Europe is, the better we have the chances also to make them really functioning cooperation with our other democratic partners. So I, I took this also as a plea to actually strengthen European strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis China through having a stronger common EU policy vis-a-vis -vis China, because otherwise uh, it is very hard to be a partner to the US if we don't even know what uh, our policy is. Sandra, would you come in uh, here on, on this uh, same question, how, how you do, how you see this issue of China and the US uh, uh, European uh, relationship? And uh, maybe you could also say something on, on 17 plus one. I, I would just like to mention from the Estonian viewpoint that uh, no, we are not happy to be in 17 plus one. For a long time, we have not been happy to be in that uh, formula. And, and we are actually looking for ways to get out of it uh, without uh, too much. Uh, damage, but we are very aware of uh, uh, of uh, how unhelpful it is uh, both for the transatlantic relationship and also for our position in the European Union. But uh, Zandra, what is your view on this? Thank you, and um, I think we can clearly see a, a paradigm shift uh, in the European Union's uh, policy towards uh, China already for a few years. Uh, so it was, for example, reflected in in a recent. Uh, uh, policy document. Actually, it was a couple of years uh, ago when we uh, named China as a strategic rival. And that was uh, first time when we clearly defined also this approach and understanding of China, not only as competitor or trading partner, but really a strategic rival. And uh, so the EU actually uh, went even further and uh, pointing at challenges and security issues posed by China's military uh, ambitions to become technologically and, and, and most advanced force by 2050. So that is the reality. And uh, since then, a more coherent uh, and, and coordinated approach uh, has been pursued, or at least we are trying to pursue um, by the EU. Uh, and it means speaking by one voice uh, and, and have our principal stance on, on different issues. Uh, and also to have this coordinated approach with, with our like-minded partners. And uh, indeed, we, we cannot uh, solve the problems we have with China without cooperation with the United States. It's, it's not possible. It will not work. 
Uh, and uh, that's why also um, when we uh, concluded the political agreement between the EU and China uh, at the end of the last year on the EU-China uh, investment agreement, so Latvia was voicing that we want uh, to have a better coordination uh, with the United States uh, on our approach towards China. And what we strongly believe is that we need to use this year not only for legal scrubbing and technical work on the EU-China investment agreement, but especially on cooperation and coordination with, with our uh, transatlantic partners. And uh, that's incredibly important because otherwise we will not be able to, 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 to uh, guarantee or, or, or even to bring closer China back to, to, to a rules-based trade system. And, and, and there are so many problems with the state subsidies, with the unfair competition uh, we are facing. And uh, also, uh, at the same time, it's also very important that the Europe is, is strengthening our instruments we have. So we developed our uh, strategic uh, investment screening mechanism. Uh, it's already one step forward. There is a lot to do still in, at the member state level to implement the system. Now also uh, the commission uh, announced that uh, they will come uh, uh, with a legal instrument in the area of, of trade policy to protect EU from uh, um, potential coercive actions of third countries. And, and it definitely is related with China. And, and so we have to build the bricks and we have to build the co coalition and alliance with, with our partners. Uh, what concerns 70 plus one, um, we are having a very pragmatic and realistic uh, uh, view on, on this format. Uh, so uh, we clearly can see that uh, China is trying to use it as a political instrument. So we are willing to see it as an instrument for co uh, economic cooperation. And uh, so uh, we are following the developments. We are really uh, analyzing uh, the situation. So uh, we are not stepping out at this moment, but we really have to, 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 to be realistic and, and see how it develops. And uh, the most important thing is to have really EU-wide China policy. And if the 70 plus one is an instrument for trade, then it's harmful, uh, then, then it's okay. Uh, but we cannot allow China to use it as a political influence instrument. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, also our colleagues are, are, are evaluating uh, how to go forward. We are definitely having coordination and, and, uh, and uh, common discussions on, on the issue with our Estonian and, and Lithuanian colleagues. Uh, so we are not blind, indeed. Yes, yes, uh, thank you. And just to add on, on, uh, on the economic aspect of 17 plus one, uh, the expectations that we initially had uh, in terms of uh, increased investment and trade have not really materialized. So that is a further, uh, further reason not to be enthusiastic about the formula, but I think the, the strategic aspects are actually the more important ones. But now, Hans Christian, you have been waiting for a long time to continue this uh, exchange between uh, you and Francois. So please, over to you. Uh, well, well uh, thank you, Christy. Um, I think what we, uh, my case is that uh, we should not now talk of uh, strategic autonomy, but we should have a very blunt and honest discussion with the United States. Uh, is it possible for Europe to uh, continue trade as before, or will we be pushed to make a choice? If we are pushed to make a choice, well then, I'm sorry, well then we have to maybe move towards greater autonomy in certain areas in order to have that freedom. But I think we need to have that discussion first with the new uh, Biden administration. Of course, uh, Secretary Blinken knows about the European sentiments. He knows this as well as he knows the American sentiments on this. Um, so if we're forced to make a choice, well, of course, then goes the neighbor. There are long-term dramatic consequences linked to security, to NATO and so forth. But we shouldn't forget also the United States needs the EU and Europe uh, and other democracies to work together. Um, they have every interest in that as well and maintain multilateral structures, global rules and norms. 
But to be honest, just to, to mention what, what Zanda is saying, that I mean, we're still making a lot of money in China. And I would argue that it's very much a question of which are our priorities. And all priorities cannot be number one. If Europe's and our government's top priority is, for example, climate change, and that is number one, and everything else is secondary, well, then we need to work with China. They have the technology, they have twice as big investments in green tech as Europe has. They are leaders, they are needed. We need to get China on board for their own sake, but also if they export bad tech and bad coal power plants to Africa, it will be a global challenge in a completely different way. So we need uh, China on board. They're the biggest fishery country, for example. We need them on board if we want to manage oceans and so forth. If, however, Russia is our number one priority and everything else is secondary, well, then, of course, then we have a different perspective. Then all of a sudden, the U.S. Uh, presence here is much more important and uh, indeed existential in, in that way. And how we then gear towards uh, hybrid threats uh, and so forth. If, however, global values is the key issue, uh, is it then, uh, as we talk about, China being a systemic rival, not a strategic rival, a systemic rival. Um, is that the big challenge of the day that all democracies, and where do we then draw the line? Do we have to draw the line by Japan, India? How about Singapore? Where do we do with uh, many countries which the economists describe as sitting on the fence or hybrid uh, democracies? Um, how much should they be involved? Or is it only a club for the ones with the gold standard, the gold uh, level. And to be honest, according to the Economist Democracy Index, the US is not a full democracy. Only 8.4% of the world's population live in fully democratic countries. Um, so how do we then draw the line? That's a tricky one. Or if our biggest priority, number one, is for example, social cohesion within our countries, unemployment, then all of a sudden trade is very, very important. Um, and investments, uh, both in and out become very, very important. So it depends on the priorities there. What I'm worried about with some of the elements of European strategic autonomy is the issue of quality. That is it more important that we have a European label on it or rather that we have the best technology, the best data and are at the cutting edge and really do compete with both the United States and China. It has to be better, not just European. If it's just national and we just stick to our good old parades and uh, tanks and aircraft and submarines, that's not good enough. We need to have the quality. So maybe quality for me and competitiveness is maybe one of the top priorities. And just finally, I think that we would be really in a different situation if we would have had TTIP, we wouldn't have had this discussion. That was a historic missed opportunity for both uh, the Europe and the US. But now we do not have that. And even the Biden administration, administration has protectionist tendencies. But still, we should not cut the ties with the US if we absolutely do not have to. So they really have to force us to do that. And therefore, we need honest and blunt discussions. And that should, those should not be held publicly. They should be off the record between heads of states and uh, between smart people who really have a long-term perspective on this. Um, but but it, it's not easy. It's tricky. Does, there's no easy silver bullet or easy solution to this as all big, important questions, they are complex. Thank you, thank you. I, I believe we can all agree that there are always difficult trade-offs uh, to be made between uh, different uh, security interests. Um, to conclude uh, this uh, China discussion, let me just note that I, I don't think cutting off ties with China is an option for anyone. The global economy is so interdependent, and this is not the issue, not for the US, not for, for Europe. But uh, what we really need to think hard about in, in, in Europe is to work on our, our China policy and, uh, and recognize that this is going to be the key issue also uh, for the transatlantic uh, relationship in, in future. But now we have uh, only 10 minutes left, and I want to use the rest of the time for uh, security in the Baltic Sea region and the relationship to Russia. Uh, we also have a couple of uh, 
questions from the audience. One of them is about uh, how to improve the EU-Russia relationship. Um, let me now also say that uh, there is still the opportunity uh, for the audience to post questions in the Q&A. But uh, now on, on Russia, indeed, I mean, one of the questions is how to improve the relations. Um, but uh, I want to add another a bit different question. And when we look at the security in the Baltic Sea region, it's uh, obvious that uh, Russia is the main concern. And uh, my question is, so what does the European strategic autonomy contribute to security in the Baltic Sea region, where NATO is in such a crucial role, and we all agree that, uh, uh, that uh, the European strategic autonomy is not about uh, replacing or competing with the role of NATO. But uh, so what is it that the EU um, adds to our regional security in the Baltic Sea region and vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, uh, assuming that uh, the strategic autonomy will uh, grow stronger in, in future. Shall we go in the original order? Ormas, would you like to start? Well, I guess it's also natural that part of strategic autonomy should be so-called European Defence Union and European Defence Cooperation. And under this framework, uh, there are also quite a lot of practical issues uh, which uh, should increase well, the sense of security in, in our region. Uh, for example, so-called military Schengen, which means that uh, the military units inside Europe can freely and quickly move if, if it's necessary. It's also European Union's uh, contribution, for example, to infrastructure in concrete countries, which also has a relationship to, to security or, or military goals. Um, all the new uh, spheres of, uh, of security, like hybrid threats, uh, cyber, here I also see good <clears throat> well, options for uh, the European Union and European Union, uh, well, hybrid and, and um, uh, IT security and cyber security to develop and so on and so on. Plus, of course, uh, as we see that in our region, we have some countries which are in NATO, some countries which are not in NATO, uh, so that part of uh, this also should be EU, NATO, much more adequate military cooperation, because it directly influences our region, where the picture is uh, uh, quite uh, different, as I, as I just said. Uh, so that, um, to put it, uh, well, <laughs> To say it shortly, then of course I see uh, clear added value also to our uh, security in our region. Plus, of course, there is a more common issue because if uh, also Europe, European Union will be stronger and the cooperation will be stronger in military sphere, then of course it also has impact to the Russian attitude vis-à-vis -vis Europe and, and the European um, Union cooperation because we clearly see that uh, Russia still underestimates and, and wants to underestimate European cooperation in the European Union and to deal bilaterally with some countries in the issues they have interest in. But if uh, Europe as such, European Union as such, is stronger also in the sphere of uh, defence and security, plus there is visible and clear cooperation between EU and NATO, then of course it also has impact to well, Russian attitude in, in larger scale. So that I see both. I see practical things which I described, some of them, plus, of course, this overall political notion. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, uh, this was a, a very good uh, list of uh, concrete issues. Uh, Sandra, would you like to add uh, something or comment on this question? Mm. Yes, actually, I, I already in my introductory remarks, which briefly touched upon uh, these uh, issues, but also, but uh, it really, uh, Corresponds also uh, if we talk about the security and our relations with Russia. Uh, so, what is the most important for me is that the European defense initiatives are to be developed in complementarity to our own efforts within NATO. 
And uh, it is important also a message. Uh, so not to give any uh, hopes for Russia that, that there will be like two tracks or, 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 or any comp uh, competition between the EU and NATO. But also what we can do uh, at the European level, uh, we really uh, can and we need to develop European capabilities uh, in, in, in our uh, military industry. So, and also, for example, uh, we can um, do more when working together uh, under the PESCO umbrella and PESCO framework. And uh, I believe PESCO is, uh, needs to be open for participation of our closest partners. Uh, and and uh, there are the discussions, for example, of, of the possible participation of UK in, 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 in the future PESCO projects. Also, uh, uh, we need uh, that participation of partners as, 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 as Europe uh, has to catch up in, in some crucial high-end, uh, indeed, uh, military technologies. So uh, that's something that we can do under this umbrella of uh, strategic uh, autonomy. So the European Defence Fund already was mentioned. It is an important uh, instrument to, to, to foster that. And, um, and, and also uh, uh, it is very, very important to, to ensure a military mobility across the continent. And it's very uh, close, there is a close link with, with security of Baltics. So we need that the Europe uh, ensures and develops military mobility so that the NATO forces or, 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 or techniques can arrive quickly if there is a moment. So, and, and military mobility, I think, is a, is a brilliant example uh, where Europe needs to do a lot to add uh, and to complement uh, what NATO is, is, is doing. And uh, another aspect is, is really uh, this investment in resilience together with the NATO. And, and uh, there is a lot we need to do um, in, in, uh, to, to, to face the hybrid threats at the EU level, but also it needs to be and, 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 and be developed as a complementary uh, to, uh, to what we are doing at, at uh, NATO. So, and, and there are things that cannot be done at the NATO level, but can be done uh, at the EU level. And, and this uh, issue of military mobility is, is a very clear example of that. Thank you. So now we heard uh, many concrete issues like military mobility, but uh, Francois, can you give us a kind of broader perspective? What do you think would change in the EU-Russia relationship if Europe were to become more autonomous? Uh, I'd be happy to do that, but I actually would like to answer the previous question as well. Uh, 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 on top of all of the important things which have just been put forward by Urmas and Zanda, and which I, I think we can all agree on, uh, there are two other things uh, which the, uh, the European Union can help bring to the table. Uh, one, uh, which is uh, the to continue to push for the increase in military spending, both, of course, within NATO members, but also non-NATO members in the Union. And this is one area where we actually have some good news in the middle of the pandemic. That is, defense spending for 2021 is increasing quite substantially in most militarily significant countries of the European Union. Sweden was mentioned, uh, you, and, and, and of course, those outside of the Union as well, Britain and France, even Germany. Uh, so this is something, uh, it's easier to get support for military spending if people understand how it can be useful for them broadly. And broadly means not simply in the NATO framework, but also the EU framework. The second point, and possibly the most important one, and that is, well, we have Article 5 in NATO. Strategic autonomy is not an Article 5 thing, but uh, one of the consequences of the debate that we're undergoing is possibly some form of emergence of an implicit Article 5 of the European Union. Of course, we have the articles in the treaties, 242, et cetera, <clears throat> uh, but they have not been considered until now as Article 5. 
now that we have serious problems between uh, Greece and Cyprus, two members of the European Union, and, uh, and a country, in, in, in this case, Turkey, well, one creates the presumption that if a European Union member is at risk, the European Union is committed to help that member uh, uh, if, of course, the, what is happening is not the fault of that member. That's not the case here. Uh, that is something very important. Finland uh, understood this actually quite early on in 2016-17. Uh, 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 you didn't hear people cavil about strategic autonomy when the EU, including the United Kingdom, introduced strategic autonomy into the strategic concept in 2016. What you heard from the Finns was much more interesting. And that was, oh, by the way, let's try and use the treaties to provide a form of security and defense guarantee. Uh, so in that sense, the debate, uh, the debate may help. The broader question, improving relations with Russia is not an objective in itself. Uh, improvement has to serve a purpose. Sometimes this purpose cannot be achieved. Uh, Macron was clearly hoping that he could help dilute the strategic partnership between Russia and China by extending a hand towards Russia. Well, that has not been working, really not. Uh, uh, so, you know, a, one should talk with Russia on issues where there can be agreement, like between the US and Russia on New START. Uh, but uh, this should be purpose driven uh, rather than driven by a sort of mushy willingness to improve relations for the sake of improving them. Thank you. I mean, this this was a point I think uh, we very much agree on, but uh, one that you don't uh, hear that uh, often from Brussels, Berlin or Paris, where the talk is much more about improving relations as a goal. Mm -hmm. But now over to Hans Christian for your uh, final comments and maybe in particular if you want to say something on this point on having something like Article 5 in the EU context, uh, Finland has taken a bit different position from uh, Sweden, but uh, Sweden also being a non-NATO member, what is your view on that? Uh, it's charming when I get to, to avoid questions in this way. Um, I would like to just uh, do what I, uh, Francois uh, just started with, some comments on the Baltic Sea. I feel that today I do not see that uh, that the EU or EU strategic autonomy uh, has an impact on deterring Moscow in, uh, in Northern Europe. Uh, I do not see that. That may change in the future, but we are very fragmented. And I think it was in the, the military balance where Europe has 17 different kinds of main battle tanks, the United States has one. So we're really talking about if we are prepared, it's easy to say we uh, cooperate and coordinate. What we're really talking about is compromising and uh, and being more rational, which is really, really politically difficult. Arroy, I mean, it's less interesting what the uh, autonomy label or whatever shoulder patch you have uh, on your, your military um, fatigues. It's more interesting what kind of quality we produce. I agree with uh, Francois, it's good that we're increasing defense budgets, but for me, it's more important what we're focusing on. And there are some elements in, uh, modern warfare, which are really difficult and politically challenging to discuss. And I'm not, not sure that the EU is prepared to take these debates. I'm talking about autonomous weapon systems, uh, reliance on AI, uh, increased use of drones, on swarm technology, on miniaturization, uh, weaponizing of space de facto. The Chinese are talking about the, the cognitive domain of warfare. It's pure Frankenstein, but that's another issue. And even the biological domain of warfare. Do we really have uh, the, the ability to have these kind of discussions among 27 to increase R&D and development of capabilities along these lines? Sure, cyber is one thing. I think we can do a lot more there. Many of the hybrid elements, information operations is easier, but some of the more difficult, the, the higher end elements are really challenging for us politically 
to, 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 to manage. So I, I'm a bit pessimistic there. It's easier with hypersonics because we all have uh, missile industries and so forth. And, but, but I'm really concerned that we're not spending on the right things. Our um, final question on a future Article 5 for, for the European Union. Uh, I mean, we have a lot of the texts already, but we have not lived up to that. And I'm afraid that the, the COVID crisis has not been our finest hour. Uh, I mean, I can be in discussions for a whole day with my colleagues in Singapore or Tokyo or Washington, and the EU is not mentioned a single time. We're not the center of everybody's attention. Uh, and yes, there will be discussion about France and Merkel and Brexit and uh, NATO and so forth. But the EU as military player or player in the security field, it's not there for many in the rest of the world. So it is an uphill battle. Uh, and I'm just worried that if we stretch too far without having our governments, but especially also our publics along with this, and that really adds an added value. It should not just be a label or a new organization or a new staff. It has to deliver output. I, I'm an old major, so I mean, you need to stop the tank, whatever means you do. And in modern warfare, that, that may not be kinetic. It may be something else. So that is my challenge for Europe. Thank you. Thank you. These were very sobering remarks. And uh, unfortunately, we have to finish uh, the discussion. I could have uh, gone on for another hour. And I really enjoyed uh, listening to our panelists. So thank you so much. I think what the panel has shown is that we are in the very beginning of the journey of actually strengthening something that can be called uh, Europe's uh, strategic autonomy. There were numerous concrete uh, steps that uh, were mentioned by the panelists, but uh, in the bigger picture, they are quite uh, small steps uh, thus far, and, and uh, a lot remains to be done uh, and, and uh, uh, this goal of uh, Europe to be a more relevant partner to the US is I think one of the important uh, goals to, to keep in mind uh, as we continue uh, the discussions on, on a more strategically autonomous uh, Europe. So thank you once again to the panelists, so thank you to the audience for joining us. Uh, thank you to our partners at the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. And let me remind all of you that uh, the Baltic EU Conversations Conference uh, will continue uh, and uh, you can follow it uh, at the webpage of the Latvian Institute of International Affairs. This panel is now closed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys. Brilliant. <laughs>